set to go again. Chris, I say next to you tonight. Speed. Set and background and action. Welcome to Cinema and the Psyche, episode one. In this episode, I thought it'd be good to maybe start near the beginning of this idea of what is cinema or cinema and the psyche. And so I wanted to talk about how are we going to, uh, what's the method of understanding the depth and power of cinema, how amazing cinema is, and and one of the reasons I think cinema is so powerful and so amazing of a medium is due to its interaction with the psyche and the power of the psyche or the individual, especially the subconscious mind, and how much the subconscious mind can affect our lives, our decisions, the way we proceed through life, and that also goes into realms that are kind of um, on the edge of what peop many people are thinking about today. Um, the power of the subconscious mind, or the power of the mind to begin with, but the subconscious mind, um, as far as I can tell, makes up the large proportion of the individual. So, I don't know, maybe consciously we're, maybe we're conscious of about 5% of what's happening within us, or less. That other 95% that we don't seem to have direct access to accounts for so much more of our life and our decisions and and therefore one of the things that makes cinema so amazing and so dangerous in certain contexts is the fact that the cinema really does speak deeper than the conscious mind. When we're watching a movie, you know, TV is also a medium that does this, but I don't care about TV. Um, cinema really does send us into an altered state uh, just, by, just by the nature of the medium itself, especially in a, in a communal setting in a good cinema. We sit there and we're carried away. Carried away largely means that we're not totally conscious of what's, of what's now taking place. We really enter an emotional, a more emotionally based realm. Good cinema, that's what it does to us. I mean, good cinema, I mean, cinema is emotional, ultimately. Many people say, you know, it's about making movies, it's about telling stories well, and it's all about the storytelling. That's all fine, but actually, cinema is really about the emotions. And in that sense, it's an emotional medium. And so being that the emotions tend to spring from our subconscious, uh, it's kind of like subconscious triggers a lot of this is happening subconsciously and movies work very powerfully over the subconscious. Of course, so I've gone into the psyche, but what I'm meant to be talking about here is how do we proceed to try and understand the depths of cinema. 
So the psyche, I'll leave aside for a moment. Cinema itself, one of the primary means, I believe, for being able to delve into the depths of what is cinema, or the cinematic form, is to analyze the different aspects that make up the medium. I'm proposing that many of the aspects that make up cinema are mm, sidelined, really, uh, in favor of, I don't know, one or two things. Let's say storytelling. You know, storytelling, everybody um, says movies are all about storytelling. Uh, D.W. Griffith, responsible for bringing, for maturing cinema, the cinematic art form, actually, by bringing uh, the great l literature, the great written works into the realm of the cinematic art, having something actually meaningful to do with cinema. So, but storytelling is just one aspect of the form. So it's a bit imbalanced to now say it's all about storytelling. Another aspect of cinema is CGI. So computer-generated graphics have just, when they entered, it's almost like they entered and then they just smothered everything else. These days, it's almost even taken the place of storytelling. But my contention is that we're taking these aspects of cinema and we're giving them too much prominence over other aspects of the cinematic form. And so I think to really understand what cinema is and especially what cinema can be is that when you look at the evolution of the cinematic form, it's easy to pick out the aspects by the diversion that was made with emerging aspects. And so probably the most prominent one that I've heard other people talk about is when sound, sync sound, entered film production, the development of the visual language, visual storytelling, was stunted because now the sound scientists on set were so important Everything was all about sync sound now. Um, microphones were in lampshades in the middle of a table. Nobody could move. Um, so this is the most prominent stunted aspect of cinema, I think, that I've heard other people speak about. So when sync sound comes along, the, visual devel the development of the visual language became stunted. And although cinematographers brought it back strongly into cinema, I believe a something was lost. Um, some type of attention was lost and never quite fully recovered. So I think that the visual grammar was compromised and never fully given its importance again. Now, of course, there's exceptions because there are great filmmakers who understand what they're doing and what they're messing with. But in the main and in the mainstream, the visual grammar, I think, uh, was hurt and the focus was never properly placed there again. And so... What I'm proposing is that this has happened many times across the history of cinema. So by looking at the aspects that were ignored by emerging technologies, we can find trails of study or trails of inquiry that we can pursue to help develop a greater picture of what cinema can be.
So I think even with the emergence of moving pictures, I believe that we're already skipping past one of the important aspects of cinema, and that is imagery and symbolism and its effect on the individual, on the psyche. So this is present in still art, in art from the beginning of art. Um, so this exists before moving pictures. Nevertheless, it's an element that is at the core of cinema and what cinema can be. So a deep study of imagery or symbolism or symbolism as a language and how effective that language can be in conveying um, ideas or com complex ideas uh, and emotions but so the idea is that a study of images and symbolism I believe is required because it's at the core and the very foundation of the cinematic form so I think pretty much this is not considered hardly at all uh, certainly I never hear about it speaking with filmmakers um, they're just kind of concerned with the more you know just getting a good actor and having something cool to say but images and symbolism over the psyche vital vital aspect and because as in all these aspects the reason they're all vital is because of the psyche and the individual and how important it is for our own conditioning and way of being and subconscious, yes, yeah, subconscious conditioning way of being and the way we direct our lives, the way, you know, our own inspirations and thoughts from where they come from. So this imagery and symbolism is actually affecting the depth of our own lives and so by not being aware of that and especially as the artist by not controlling that we're missing out on a huge aspect of cinema so anyway that's present in painting and various painters across time have been more or less educated in symbolism its meaning and imagery and communicating messages visually in other forms than you know alphabets and then comes moving pictures so I believe with moving pictures something magic was created um, truly magic it's why I love cinema uh, I am watching Terrence Malick last night a Terrence Malick movie last night and I feel like he's someone who really appreciates the magic of moving pictures. So there's this very base element, you know, after imagery and symbolism, which is, you know, one of the things, one of the vital tools you have and things you're using, is just simply movement reproduced. Amazing thing that we can reproduce movement on a wall on a screen, through a projector. Um, this is a huge, huge invention, obviously. And basically, uh, everybody's interacting with this aspect probably a large portion of their day. So, with moving pictures, uh, you can become preoccupied and forget about the pictures themselves, almost. And so then you have moving pictures. So there's the magic, the pure magic of motion reproduced. That, I believe, is an aspect warranting uh, further attention, 
uh, Terrence Malick in the popular mainstream, I believe, is someone who does it very well. You know, we have, you know, the Matrix, Bullet Time, and all of its copies, and, you know, what is it, John Woo and his slow motion action sequences. So this is all delving into just the beauty of movement, movement reproduced important aspect of cinema, often forgotten, I think warranting further study. After that in the history of film, very quickly after filming waves hitting a beach and the like, uh, we have, you know, the filming of the human body in movement. I call it mime, but that's just how I represent it in my mind. The, the human body in movement um, becomes the next focus for cinema. Maybe this originates out of, you know, vaudeville or, or you also have ballet, dance. Um, this itself is an intriguing aspect. Uh, another thing Terrence Malick s seems to do, although he's a little light on the storytelling as of late, uh, he appears to be very strong in these other aspects of cinema. Um, so the movement of the body, and then very quickly uh, comes storytelling and literature, and I feel as soon as literature and storytelling enter the cinematic realm, um, it's almost as though uh, the first three elements that I just mentioned, imagery and symbolism on the psyche, um, the magic of movement reproduced, and mime, or the body in motion, the human body in motion, it's almost as though these are not very important anymore. It now becomes all about storytelling, literature, and that's pretty much lasted to today. So it's the most sought after, you know, skill to be able to tell a great story. So storytelling is obviously an important aspect of cinema. We all want to experience a great story. Uh, told. We want to identify with the characters in great stories so we can, by proxy, experience uh, great greatness. Um, so that's good, but it's only an aspect of cinema. So then, while storytelling is, you know, prominent, then the next thing I outlined as an important development that sidelined other aspects of cinema is the emergence of, yeah, sound, sync sound. So sync sound comes along. We had previously storytelling largely visually, which is pr probably one of the most amazing aspects of cinema. And it was developing very strongly. And, and in fact, I don't think it's developed very far beyond the moment Sync Sound entered the visual storytelling. So you have visual storytelling and then you have visual grammar. So you have the tools, the visual tools that you use to tell stories. So both of these... Uh, I don't think have advanced much beyond the 30s. Everything was being done. Uh, maybe a little bit's been added here or there. You know, um, I have heard, you know, the filmmakers I really look up to as the, the greatest filmmakers around now saying how visual language is changing and um, I don't personally think that's possible 
because I think visual language or the yeah the grammar of cinema I think is based on our own experience our own perceptual experience as human beings and therefore it can't really change unless our human perceptual experience changes uh, which that doesn't happen very often so I really think the grammar of cinema is not changing I think what might be changing is people are becoming filmmakers or cinematographers are becoming uh, less sophisticated or outright ignorant as to the grammar of film and so we're seeing lots of things done with a camera with filmmaking that are like incorrect uses of the language a little bit like abbrevi everybody's abbreviating their text messages you know vocabularies are decreasing the problem with that is is it, as one's vocabulary decreases as the words decrease in, in people's language actually our ability to experience decreases um, so it's dangerous to become uneducated as to the nature of language whether it be the written word or cinema and so we have a visual grammar that's based on our perception our perceptions in life and when it becomes detached from that it's no longer actually visual language it's um it's just whatever it is it's just unaffected basically it's just weird um, so anyway where was I so the emergence of sound stunted the evolution of the visual grammar and the or the the understanding of the visual grammar but it stunted the evolution of visual storytelling and then comes color into photography and so I've also heard many cinematographers speak highly of the cinematographers in black and white suggesting that their photographic abilities their abilities to understand light and shadow were so much higher and again the evolution of our ability to use light and shadow I think could have become I think it did become sidelined by the emergence of color and then of course now we have color um, so you know Vittorio, Vittorio Storaro someone who has developed some amazing consciousness and theories around color and the use of color I haven't I want to read more of what Vittorio is, has developed and but uh, see because I'm not sure whether he's suggesting uh, that his you know explorations of color are a personal thing to him or whether he feels he's uncovering universal principles of color um, but nevertheless there are there appear to be universal aspects of color and how they affect the psyche and so it's almost as though the emergence of these various aspects of cinema even though they're they've come over a period of a hundred years um, they're almost coming too fast or at least mm, the filmmakers themselves in the main are not dedicated to understanding the significance of these various discoveries and so color um, you know these days you know maybe we have like a red door or a red doorknob or you know a yellow dress or you know whatever it might be but 
the aspect of color, um, color film, your entire frame is full of color, is highly significant. And so there's a lot to be uh, delved into in that. And before that, there's a lot to be delved, delved into, delved, if that's a word, delved into in terms of simply light and shadow and conveying not only stories but emotions. I mean, ultimately, again, the cinematic form is an emotional one. So what we're actually dealing in here is not stories exactly, we're dealing in emotions. So stories are created to create emotion. Emotion is a more sophisticated, you know, deeper, higher element than just, you know, thoughts and ideas, right? Emotions are more powerful, especially over the psyche. And therefore, those who understand how to manipulate emotions or create the desired emotions far more powerful with the form. And then with the emergence of CGI, we're really just like floored with tools that we have no understanding of what to do with. So now we've got CGI, uh, color, you know, forget about it. You know, yeah, you can have a color tone for your movie and it's nice and it's kind of, you know, uh, related to the, the style of the movie. That, you know, it's all nice and it's good, but I think there's a lot more to be found. And I don't believe it's going to be 3D. And uh, Walter Murch wrote a great piece about why 3D as it is today is simply not going, you know, we're not, our eyes are not made to experience the type of 3D that's being given to us in the cinema. Um, I think maybe I'll find that article and I'll put that in the notes uh, to this podcast. And there was one more thing I wanted to add to this episode is probably one of the most influential... It was delivered as a speech at the Directors Guild, but I didn't hear it, I read it. One of the most influential pieces over my own understanding of cinema. Um, I don't know, I don't think Elia Kazan gave it a title, his speech, but anyway, as it's written on, online, it's called What a Director Needs to Know. And so I'm going to link to that at the bottom of this episode as well on cinemaandthepsyche.com where he outlines all of the all of the important subjects the director should know and the reason it's so wonderful is because you realize that if you hadn't already that is the language you're using incorporates every aspect of you know the nature of reality basically you know weather artistic movements painting sculpture dance photography lighting sound um, acting psychology um, you know and he just goes on and on and on revealing the amazing tools uh, that we have to master so I'm sure you can tell that there was just a break I had to rush away because I realized I was burning something on the stove um, in any case I was rounding it up for the end anyway um, the Elia Kazan piece I'm going to link to the bottom because that's very interesting uh, speech he gave at the Directors Guild other than that, the website is cinemaandthepsyche.com. Uh, there's links on there to Facebook and all the other type of social media platforms. I'm on the iTunes store. I'm on stitcher.com now. So if you feel, if you enjoy this and you feel like leaving a review, although it's only 
the first episode and an intro episode, uh, feel free to do it. That would be nice. Other than that, um, you can write directly to me with any questions or criticisms or comments at matt at cinemaandthepsyche.com, M-A-T-T, at cinemaandthepsyche.com. I realize, uh, listening back to where I had left off, that there is some uh, traffic uh, in the background that can be a little distracting. I'm going to try and reduce that, but at present I'm recording these, you know, outside, sometimes walking, sometimes not. So, but I'll try and keep the background noise to a minimum. Thanks for joining me, and uh, I hope you come back for episode two.